Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Certificate of Retirement from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. <coughs> to all who shall see these present greetings, this is to certify that Chief Master Sergeant Lee Sexton, having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Air Force on the first day of February, 1999. Signed, General Michael E. Ryan, Chief of appreciation for the service in the armed forces of the United States, I extend to you my personal thanks and the sincere appreciation of our nation for your honorable service. You helped to maintain the security of the United States of America with a devotion to duty that is in keeping with the proud tradition of our armed forces. I honor your service and respect the commitment and loyalty you displayed over the years. My best wishes to you for happiness and success in the future. Signed, Bill Clinton, Commander in Chief. That's our Wilson. Certificate of Appreciation from the United States Air Force to all who, who shall see these present greetings. This is to certify that Leslie Sexton, on the occasion of the retirement of her husband from active duty with the United States Air Force, has earned grateful appreciation for her own unselfish, faithful, and devoted service. Her unfailing support and understanding helped to make possible her husband's lasting contribution to the nation on the first day of February, 1,999. Signed, General Michael E. Ryan, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, and Brigadier General William W. Smoke, Commander, 2nd Bomb Wing. <coughs> Let's give Chief Master a
flag folding ceremony represents the same religious principle on which our country was originally founded. The portion of the flag denoting honor is the canton of blue containing the stars representing states our veterans served in uniform. second fold is the symbol of our belief in the in eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran departing our ranks who gave a portion of his life for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth bowl represents our weaker nature. For as American citizens trusting God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. The fifth bowl is a tribute to our country. For in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right. But it is still our country right or wrong. The sixth pole is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The seventh pole is a tribute to our armed forces for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all of our enemies, whether they should be found within or outside the boundaries of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and to honor mother for whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is tribute to womanhood, for it has been through her faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to Father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since he or she was first born. The eleventh fold, in the eyes of a Hebrew citizen, represents the lower portion of the soul of King David and King Solomon, and in their eyes, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The twelfth fold, in the eyes of a Christian citizen, represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The 13th fold represents the 13 colonies reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington and the sailors and Marines who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their comrades and shipmates into the armed forces of the United States, preserving under the rights, privileges, and freedoms we enjoy today, thus establishing our country's foundation. <coughs> After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, where the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, in God we trust.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Colonel Kenzie will now present Chief Master Sergeant Sexton with the Air Force Retirement Band. <laughs> a couple of things to you all to try and put this in perspective. Uh, there is uh, no doubt in my mind that uh, at his request there would have been any number of general officers in our Air Force that would have come here to do this, to retire this man. Consequently, uh, the only reason I share that with you is to try and impart a little bit of the tremendous honor I felt and being asked by Chief Sexton to officiate his retirement ceremony in the security of our nation. I had the privilege of commanding the 2nd Security Forces Squadron at Barksdale Air Force Base from the 20th of July, 1995 to the 19th of June, 1998. I relinquished that command a week prior to assuming this command here Commandant of the Security Forces Academy. Chief Sexton was already at Barksdale performing duties as a Security Forces Manager. So I was fortunate to have a Chief Master Sergeant that was already there, already knew the lay of the land, already knew the unique things that were going on in a big unit like that. The Second Security Forces Squadron has about 500 people assigned to it. It's the largest nuclear bomb mission we have in the United States Air Force, Air Combat Command. It's singularly the largest bomb wing in the entire world, free or enemy. Try and put a little bit of perspective on the uh, level of responsibility and the things that the Chief and I dealt with. We, uh, we went through a lot of good and bad times there. I know, especially for uh, the young troops here, some of this isn't going to mean a lot to you right away, but trust me, as you gain some experience in your first duty station, your second duty station, if you happen to remember this ceremony, and I hope you do, then perhaps some of what I'm about to tell you will have some meaning at that point. Those of you who have been around for a while are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. About what, nine months after I arrived, we had a combined inspection team come in. From at that point, the Air, the, uh, Air Combat Command Inspector General of the Defense Nuclear Agency, which is a literally a Department of Defense level inspection. Now, the thing that you need to understand about an Inspector General inspection is it's bad enough when they come from the major air command itself, but when they literally have a Department of Defense Inspector General team in with them, the inspectors feel like they're being inspected while they're conducting an inspection. So consequently, they just dig in that much harder. They just micro-examine every possible little thing you can think of. It was a combined nuclear surety inspection with a nuclear operational readiness inspector. So they not only looked at our day in and day out procedures for nuclear security, they also looked at our emergency war orders and our capability to generate the nuclear force to launch in support of U.S. Strategic Command. 
<coughs> I'm here to tell you that was 13 and a half days of unmitigated hell. It was some tough times. But it was because of uh, Chief Sexton and a number of other highly dedicated and professional senior NCOs, NCOs, airmen, company grade officers that had been there for uh, had been there for a while and had been doing the tough job and stepped up to the challenge and were doing the tough thing, the unit did well. Did extremely well. Shortly after that, my father passed away. And then his dad passed away. Then the IG came back to visit us again. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was really, it was like a double kick in the gut, I guess is the best way to put it. And you'll have to excuse me for getting a little emotional about it, but it's truly because of the things that we went through together, both professionally and personally. <laughs> He helped me survive that command. And in a small way, I kind of like to think that I've helped him survive too. <laughs> but uh, the other part of this equation is, as everybody knows, a military organization, we have core values. I know, you know all the airmen here that have recently graduated from basic military training are now going through the different phases and stages of the security forces academy and of course the NCOs and officers have been around for a while. <laughs> you know about that. We've had core values for a long, long time before they were encapsulized and they were shrunk down to what they are today. We also have standards and rules that are a little different than they are in the civilian world from the standpoint of uh, professional relationships versus unprofessional relationships, fraternization, <laughs> so on and so forth. What I'm about to tell you is uh, that's all very good and proper for a military organization. But there's a unique environment that exists between a squadron commander and the chief master sergeant of a unit. You know, that capability, that level of trust that exists when these two people can sit down together behind closed doors and literally spill their guts about what's going on. That's vitally important to a commander. You know, for you supervisors in here, I'm sure you can appreciate this. For you troops here that someday are going to be supervisors, you know, I can tell you right now, the one thing I have never appreciated or respected as an Air Force leader is someone that comes in and tells me what they think I want to hear versus telling me how it is. It's crucially important that those doors of communication are open and that you can trust your people to tell you how it is. And it really exists very closely between the security forces manager and the chief of security forces, also known as the security forces squadron commander. And it's no different here, even though this is not a line unit or a training unit, same thing. Same levels of responsibility, same things, same things we have to deal with, and so on and so forth. And Chief Sexton has been that and more. He always had the courage to come in. If he thought I was wrong, yeah. he wouldn't sit there and say something that's fascinating necessarily, but you could get that your boot. He was there almost kicking the door down after the meeting, and he'd come in, boss, you're wrong. You, know, you need to rethink this. And he'd explain why, and I'd listen, and we'd press on from there. And I can't say that every time he told me I was wrong, I necessarily changed my mind, but I appreciated the fact that he had the guts and the intestinal fortitude to do that. He's also the kind of individual that was never afraid to stand up to a challenge. Or if there was something broke in the system, he had the courage to take it on. And it didn't make any difference 
how many chief master sergeants or captains or colonels or generals or what have you might have been in the West. And when this guy grabs hold of something and he knows he's right, he presses on. And that takes courage. That takes a lot of, of moral courage, a lot of intestinal fortitude. It, it takes true conviction and belief in what you do. Everybody in here now wearing the badge and those of you that soon will be wearing the badge recognize and appreciate there's a great deal of responsibility and trust placed in us far above and beyond the typical member of the United States Air Force. Unlike the typical airman or officer out there on the street, we have the power to arrest people. We have the power to enforce law. We uphold the standards. You'll find out on any given day that most everybody on that base looks to what the security police are doing and the security forces squadron to figure out what the standard is and what's tolerated and what's not. And you're going to find that other agencies and other squadrons on a given base are measuring themselves against what the security forces squadron is doing. This is the kind of man right here that always made sure that the security forces squadron, wherever he was at, was meeting that mark, was stepping out in front, was meeting the challenge, was not doing it. I could go on and on and on. I really could. But suffice it to say that I have considered it a true privilege and a pleasure to be able to spend three years as a squadron commander with Chief Master Sergeant Lee Sexton as my security forces manager. You know, good and bad times. You know, the bad times are kind of really fuzzy memories now. I kind of even have to think to remember, you know, what was really you know, not so great about it. But I always remember something else I heard, you know, and that has to do with, uh, you know, your, your worst day on a, your, your worst day in a unit is better than your best day on the staff. So, you know, it just kind of goes hand in hand. You always keep that sort of thing in perspective. Also, the chief spent, I think it was, what, seven years here as an instructor at the Security Forces Academy. Matter of fact, one of his fellow instructors was sitting right up here in front and came in to be with the chief today. I heard some really interesting stories over the last week. And it was part of that, one of the reasons the chief wanted to come back here and spend his last week in uniform, his last week on active duty, to what he calls home, the United States Air Force Security Forces Academy. <laughs> And, it's, uh, and I'd like to thank, uh, I know for myself, and I'd like to thank on behalf of uh, the faculty and staff that it has truly been an honor and a privilege and a pleasure having you with us this week. I know I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a lot of fun reminiscing and talking about old times and what's been going on. Oh, one other little story i got to tell <laughs> Great to be the commander. <laughs> okay. The lieutenants here will get a chuckle out of this, too. I came on active duty in October of 77, and uh, didn't have, I was in flying training, didn't have a, a, a uh, slot here at the SF Academy when I was medically grounded from flying training. And I came here to the Academy in the uh, winter of 1978. Well, that kind of sets the stage. When I got to Barksdale, and that was the first time I met the chief was in 1995, you know, the thought kind of crossed my mind, you know, I've seen this guy somewhere before, and I, and I couldn't quite pin it. And as a matter of fact, it was a year and 18 months, I think, before the uh, dim light started to grow, or glow a lot bright enough that I finally put two and two together. I remember as Second Lieutenant Kennedy at Camp Bullock, fumbling with parts in an M60, and Staff Sergeant Lee Sexton looking over me. You know, Lieutenant, you haven't figured that out yet? <laughs> so I've known him a lot longer than I, than I thought. But uh, I, I thought that was real interesting. Uh, you know, and I, when I finally recognized and realized he was one of my instructors when I was down here. <laughs> no wonder I turned out so warped. <laughs> okay. I have a little memento here, the Chief, I'd like to present to you that has the uh, Defensive Fortress uh, logo on it 
and synopsis of what we're all about, the Air Force Security Forces, and of course the, uh, the translation that reads The Defender of the Force. I hope maybe you'll find a special place to uh, remind you of this week. And there's a letter on the back I'd like to read. And it's addressed to Chief Master Sergeant Tom L. Sexton, Jr. Dear Chief Sexton, in recognition of your last week on active duty that you chose to spend here at the Security Force of the Academy, culminating with your retirement ceremony today, Friday, 20 November 98, I am pleased to present this gift to you as a reminder of this special occasion. You will always be considered a part of the Security Forces Academy, and we hope that you will return and visit often. I wish you all the best in the future, and hope that when you look back on this memento, it will bring back many fine memories. Sincerely, J.R. Kinsey Command. <laughs> Life. 
but not like the influence of certain folks in your military community that you'll find as you grow and as you learn what this is really like. There's a gentleman back in the back of the room. They call him now here in the realm of black, but Mr. Bowden. He's a GS 1000 and whatever. <laughs> well, to you he may be Mr. Bowden, but to people like Frank Joyce and myself, he will always be the chief. And I will never refer to him as anything but. When I was a cocky little son of a gun and uh, needed some direction and needed some perspective, that was my chief. The last thing I ever wanted to get involved with when I got here was tactics and air-based defense and EST and all the other kind of things. And for whatever his reasons, Chief Bowden forced me into that, along with Colonel Bernie Denisio. <coughs> And I got to be a big part of that. And I'm going to tell you something that Chief Bowden doesn't know. In 1995, I was part of a special team to go over and do security assessments in the AOR, in the Kuwaiti Saudi Arabia Theater of Operation. And we made 43 specific recommendations, some of which were followed, some of which wasn't. There was a tragic bombing. But during the course of that, I remember some things that Chief Bowden had emphasized when we were down here about tactics and various things he made us read, and he talked about things like high ground advantage and other things like that, and how to properly put LPs and OPs out, and all the other kind of things that he used to nag us with all the time. And when we had Riyadh bombed the week after I got there, we made a decision to put listening and observation posts on the rooftops of Kofar Towers. And the post government was not real happy about that. As a matter of fact, the security police commander and I almost got relieved of duty and sent home over it. And there was a big row over that. And we got into some serious trouble. Had to make a lot of trips to see a lot of people. Got cards and letters from folks I didn't even know knew me. <laughs> As it turned out, we convinced the powers that be that those observation and listening posts needed to be there based on things that Chief Bowden had taught me years ago and allowed me to be taught. And when that, that was not the ideal situation that we wanted, that was not the way we would have preferred for that area to be protected. But when that bomb blew two months after I departed, and there was about 19 deaths, some 200 some odd people injured. The estimated casualties of what would have happened if those young security forces members had not sounded the alarm, detected that vehicle bomber, and begun the evacuation, they estimated there may have been anywhere from six to 900 casualties. The discipline, the ideals, the teamwork that a man like Chief Master Sergeant Patrick Bobman instilled in me, whether he knows it or not, he is one of the reasons there are about 900 young men and women in the Air Force alive today, Chief. And I don't want to hear none of this Mr. Crap to me, you're always the Chief. hour news cycle that didn't sit very well with me. I saw a crossfire, for instance, a very high-ranking member of our government and was talking about the role of the military and about how really the peacekeeping missions and other things that are going on today really, since we're not doing much of anything anyway, we need to get the military more involved in these kinds of things. 
And that stuck in my mind because that was the same day that we got word. I got a phone call at 2 a.m. that one of my young airmen was killed in Kuwait in a vehicle accident during a force protection escort of some command post controllers and some sensitive material they were carrying. My young man was the driver and a young airman, both graduates of this academy from Vandenberg, was the rider. And later on during the week, Colonel Kinsey's successor mm -hmm. had asked me to delay being relieved of duty and come in and do the eulogy for the young man, and, and I was supposed to read the security police prayer, which was a very honor, I was honored to do. And on the way over there, I overheard a very senior person talking about what a waste of a life for a young man to have died in a vehicle accident so far away from home. And as I walked into that chapel, I got angry. And at the last minute, I told the young captain who was in charge of the eulogy, I'm not reading the prayer. I want to talk to the men and women of our unit. And he, blood all rushed from his face. Because he, he, he guy had that, oh my God, what's going to come out of his mouth next? <laughs> And in the front row were the man, young man's parents and his grandparents who had spent the day with us. We'd taken him to show him where he worked, where he lived, what his job was. Out there was the mother of his unborn child. And what I said to that group, I want to say to you. Look around the room at the men and women in here in uniform and have worn the uniform. Less than one-tenth of your peers today volunteer, raise their hand and say, I do, and agree to do what you have done. A week before Charles Campbell left for the Kuwaiti Theater of Operation, I was on a post check, and he asked me about how to become a chief and what he needed to do to progress, and he'd just gotten an exceptionally well-qualified and his quality control and he really loved what he was doing. And I told him by volunteering to go into harm's way, he'd already taken the first step because he was putting his country in service ahead of selfish needs. He was doing something that less than one third of the elected officials, local, state, and federal in this country today have done, wear the uniform of their country. Charles asked me about where he was going and what he would be doing, and I said, told him some stories about the highway of death and other things over there, and the old U the UXOs and the Iraqi minefields where I lived when I was over there. And I said, but Charles, I'm proud of you because you slung your rifle, you raised your hand, you said I do, and you're willing to go. Now when Charles got over there, on the day of that escort, he was on his way to the Kuwaiti International Airport. An NCO of mine by the name of Alonzo Brown was responsible for securing that airport. And if Alonzo Brown, he's so big he blocked out the sun, but if he were here today, he would tell you, one of the places where our troops live over there is a, is a block of old barracks. And right away, you notice something unique about those old barracks. And that is the walls are extremely white. And it kind of stands out from anything else on the, on the base. And you wonder why the walls are extremely white. Well, it's because about every three months, those walls have to be re-whitewashed. Because grayish, brownish stains start to come through these walls. Because that's where Saddam Hussein rounded up all the old men, women, and children, and had his Republican guard machine gunned them to death during the early weeks of the war. And the blood stains soak into the mortar and the brick on those walls, and they still come through today, so they have to keep whitewashing them. But the whitewash doesn't keep the blood stains away. <clears throat> Charles Campbell, like you, <coughs> raised his hand, said, I do, slung his rifle, and he was willing to go. 
down the other road where Charles Campbell was heading away from, on the other side of Algebra, is one of the most modern hospitals in the world. Kuwait is a very rich nation. And during the first week of the war, Saddam's Republican Guardsmen went into that hospital, gutted the whole place, took the x-ray machines, took the MRI machines, took the incubators, left premature children there to die, left old men and women who were sick there to die, some of them did, rounded up all the new cars and all the car dealerships, put all that equipment on there, and headed off north to Baghdad. Charles Campbell, like you, slung his rifle, raised his hand, said, I do, and went there so that that does not happen again. He went there so that that stained wall does not happen again. That's what you are about. That's what we are about. I don't care what you see on CNN about what the people think the military is and what we are. We are a profession at arms. We are honorable men and women. And this chief, the ranking chief in this career field as of right now, says, thank God for you. And the United States of America should be on its knees every night, thanking God for you, thanking God for Charles Campbell's, so that those bloody walls never happen again. I am honored to even be in the same room and breathe the same air with men and women like you, like Chief Bowden, like Colonel Kinsey, like Frank Joyce, Jackie MacGyver, John Franklin back there hiding. That's what you are about, men and women. Slinging your rifle, raising your hand, saying, I do and being the best of what this country has to offer. Because I'm here to tell you, you are it. Thank you. Oh! Thank <laughs> you. 